We previously coded up days of the week. Now let's code up something that uh, is really built into nearly every programming language, which is Booleans. We can code those up ourselves in Calk. The inductive type bool is actually prettified. You can see that again. This nice math kind of symbol for bool is really a prettified version of B-O-O-L. Let me show that to you. If I type B-O-O-L, it wants to autocomplete it to something else. I'll cancel the autocomplete. Now I've got just that symbol for bool. There are a few other nice prettified symbols like this, like we'll see soon for natural numbers. So the inductive type bool has exactly two things that could be true or false. Uh, we call each of these things constructors. That's the same as in OCaml, for example. Constructors of this inductive type. Uh, by the way, Monday, Tuesday, and so forth, those were constructors of the inductive type day. So we've got two possibilities for bool. I'll compile that. And this says bool is defined along with some other things. Again, we will be coming back to some of those later. Now, Booleans are actually defined in Cox standard library. We don't need to define them ourselves, but it's nice to be able to see that, in fact, you can define these from scratch as an example of um, simple things so that later on when you want to code up something more complicated, you have the basic ideas down. All right, so uh, with that spirit in mind, let's code up some function on Bools, uh, which could be built into the standard library, but we can code them up ourselves. Here's a definition of negation on Booleans. So this is a function that I'm defining. The name of the function is neg b. I'm negating a Boolean. Uh, I'm taping, taking in a Boolean b as input. So that's a, an argument b, which has type bool. And the output of the function is going to be a bool. So I'm writing colon bool here to show that. And this function is defined to be the following. It is a pattern match. I match against that Boolean b. If it's true, I return false. If it's false, I return true. So I'm just flipping it around. Again, remember that double arrow there, which is being prettified by Emacs or maybe your IDE as well. That's really a prettified version of equal greater than. OK, so I'll compile that definition. That's negation. And I could do many of the other standard functions on Booleans. For example, here's the definition for conjunction, the logical and of two Booleans. So if B1 is true, well, then it would be whatever b2 is, because if b2 is true, that should be true. If b2 is false, it should be false. Uh, on the other hand, if b1 is false, well, then I don't even need to check what b2 is. Uh, the and of anything with false is going to be false. So now I've got the definition of, of logical and down. Uh, logical or, basically the same idea here, right? Take in two Booleans, b1 and b2, match b1. If it's true, return true. If it's false, return whatever the other one is. By the way, we've just had our first example of a function that takes in multiple arguments, in this case two arguments, b1 and b2. Uh, so we wrote each of them in its own set of parentheses there, gave the type of each of them. As it turns out, there's a nice syntactic simplification Cock allows. kind of wish other languages would do this at times too. Uh, you can actually have the two arguments of the same type there, collapse them into a single uh, set of parentheses there that say, take in two arguments, b1 and b2, both of type bool. Okay. And that's the same function. We could now uh, write unit tests or examples as we did before with days of the week uh, to specify maybe some of the truth table for the disjunction here for or b. So if you take the or of true and false, you ought to get true. That puts us back into proof mode here. We now have a goal that we need to achieve. Let's step through this proof again a little slowly just to review it. Uh, we start off a proof with the vernacular command proof. Uh, now, what do we want to show? Well, actually, I'm missing the goals window here. So sometimes this happens in IDEs. Uh, things get a little bit out of sync. Uh, in Emacs, uh, Control-C, Control-L will refresh that window layout. Now I see my sub goals window again. Uh, so now you know how to solve that if that happens to you. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to prove that or b true false equals true. Well, let's try to simplify the left hand side of it first. So I'll use the simple tactic, which does that. That's simplified to true on the left hand side. Great. Now I need to show that true equals true. The tactic for uh, showing that anything is equal to itself is reflexivity. Good. No more sub goals. I'm done with that proof. I do QED to finish it off. OK, the rest of these uh, for the truth table for or work exactly the same way. Uh, trying to do false, 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 true, true, true. Every single one of those has exactly the same proof pattern there. 
Okay, so now we've, in a sense, verified our implementation of OR by checking what it should produce for all of the possible inputs that it could receive. We wouldn't have to use a function ORB or B for, for this. We could, in fact, define infix notation, which, of course, is what any normal programming language would do. Uh, Cock lets us extend the syntax of the language with a notation command. Uh, so we're defining a new notation. Now, the syntax for defining syntax here is itself a little tricky. We're not going to go directly into a lot of detail on that. But just so you know that this notation is, in fact, defined by the standard library, and you can define such notations yourself if you want, if you want to learn more about this kind of meta syntax. But we're defining a notation here double ampersand for and, if you have x double ampersand y, we are telling Cock we want it to be understood as the function and be applied to x and y. Likewise for uh, the or symbol here, now in this case that's actually the double vertical pipe, but Emacs is prettifying it as you can see down here at the bottom. Okay, so now with those definitions we could do things like false or false or true. Uh, that's another simple proof with just simple and reflexivity. Another way to define these functions uh, would be with if expressions in Cock. So we did it with uh, uh, with pattern matching up here above when we did uh, or b, for example. If you want to do it with if expressions, you can do that too. So the if expression is written with the keywords if, then, and else. Uh, you may be used to this from another language. You may be not used to exactly this, but perhaps a ternary operator wouldn't written with a question mark and colon from another language. It's the same idea. Uh, evaluate this expression between the if and the then. Uh, it's I call that the guard of the expression. So evaluate the guard of the if expression. Uh, then if it's true, evaluate the then branch and return that. If it's false, evaluate the else branch and return that. So how do we negate a Boolean? Well, Evaluate it. If it evaluates to true, we want to flip that around, go to false. If it evaluated to false, though, we want to return true. So that's another way of defining negation. And note that the name I've given this function here is neg b prime. Cock does let you use things like prime, kind of mathematical notation. I like that. Uh, also, also OCaml does that sort of thing. If you want to take the logical conjunction of b1 and b2, uh, we could do that. If b1 is true, then return b2 else false. Right. So uh, whether or not this is like actually great style or not, let's not get into that. Uh, the point is I just want to illustrate the if expression syntax for you. Okay, we could do it for or as well. Now we come to our first exercise in this set of notes. Actually, the exercises really won't be in the notes very often. Uh, they are in the textbook chapters. Exercises for you to do, to check your understanding, to dig deeper into cock, to learn new things yourself. But we have this in the notes here just as an opportunity for me to explain a little bit about what's going on with these exercises. So you'll recognize them that they say exercise here. Uh, there's a name for the exercise if you ever want to refer to it for someone to like, like know what you're looking at. Uh, there's a number of stars for each exercise, which is how difficult it's purported to be. Uh, the preface chapter gives some time guidelines on maybe what we think the number of stars for each problem is. Uh, let me say this, uh, one star and probably two star problems as well are ones that are really good to do if you're just wanting to follow along with a chapter and get a basic understanding of what's going on. If you want to be able to write co cock code yourself, though, with a certain amount of expertise, you're going to want to do the three star and probably the four star problems as well. Each exercise also has a description of, um, well, well, some labels that can be applied to it. Standard just means this is a standard exercise that everyone should be expected to do. Uh, there are some recommended exercises that are like extra good ones. Uh, there are some advanced exercises uh, in some places where we teach this course. Uh, for example, maybe the advanced exercises are done by a group of people in the class who are registered for like a more difficult version of the course, like maybe a master's version of the course versus undergrad or something like that. In any case, you're watching these videos Maybe you're do, taking a class yourself, in which case your instructor will tell you which exercises to do. Or if you're just self-studying this on your own, may I recommend that you just do the standard exercises uh, in your first pass through if you just want to get an understanding of the most basic material in the textbook. Okay, uh, these exercises 
generally formatted like this. Uh, if, if the exercise expects you to provide a definition, it will have a big comment here that says, replace this line with colon equals your definition, and then it will say admitted. And my IDE here highlights the admitted to make it clear that like something bad could be going on here. Basically, uh, we haven't finished this definition, right? That's why it's complaining uh, in the syntax coloring about the admitted. It wants to warn me, hey, there's a big piece of thing that's missing here. Now that's okay. It'll let me compile that. It's just I can't really do much with it. Uh, you know, I get down here. I don't want, know what NAND B is going to be. I'm not going to be able to do this proof yet. So I also have to admit that proof. Okay. All right, so I'm not even providing a, a definition here. Now you you might be a little nervous here to begin with, like, oh wait, Cock lets you like not define things, or you can not have finished proofs. Don't worry. You can check a file when you compile it to make sure that like everything is defined. You can see uh, uh, what assumptions various definitions rely on. And so you can take a close look at yourself to see, oh, uh, is this uh, exercise maybe depending on some unproved lemma or something like that? Uh, in fact, when we teach this course at universities, we have auto graders that do exactly that sort of thing to look and make sure uh, that there are no um, assumptions that were unproved that are used as part of required exercises, for example. Okay, so you can do that kind of checking. Uh, it's not actually like some sort of big hole in the system or something like that. Okay, so you could finish this off with your own definition of NAND B. Uh, maybe I'll write one right here with us. So what is the negation of the AND of B? Well, we could directly write a pattern match for that. We could also maybe write something like uh, the neg B of the AND B of B1 and B2. Right, so that's not really a, a, a direct definition of it. It's defining it in terms of other functions, but let's see if that can work. Let's see, how do we do this proof? Um, well, we've always started off with simplification before. Uh, and that didn't actually work there. Uh, the problem is this non-direct definition of NAND B up here in which uh, we've got it actually in terms of NEG B and AND B. Simple isn't quite clever enough to do that. Okay. Uh, in a future video, I'll go into why this is, some of the complexities of simple as it were. Uh, one solution here is you could skip over the simplification and just try reflexivity. As it turns out, that works. Because reflexivity is actually more aggressive in what it does in order to try to simplify an expression than even simple itself is. Again, in a future video, I'm going to go into some of the complexities of that. So that's one solution there. You could say QED and done. OK. Uh, another possibility would be to go back and provide a direct definition of NAND B. So if I head back up here, I could match B1 with, well, let's see. Uh, if B1, well, what do we want NAND B to be? Uh, it should be true unless both B1 and B2 are true. In fact, we can see that in the sort of truth table that we've given here for our examples. Only case that should result in false is when both of them are true. OK, so if B1 is false, then we should immediately return true. Otherwise, if B1 is true, well, then we need to check B2, right? So if B2 is false, return the opposite of it in both of those cases there. So uh, one way to handle that would be we could do a nested pattern match here, match B2 with uh, if it is false, return true. Otherwise, if it's true, return false. Notice that the match ends with the keyword end here, and I'm nesting it inside, so I've got to put that keyword end in, in both of those. So this end terminates that match, this end terminates that match. Okay, so now I have a much longer definition of NAND B, uh, but it is a little more direct, and so what you would expect to have happen uh, with simple is actually going to work here. Undo that, actually, so you can see what's going on. We've got NAND B true false on the left hand side. Now we want to simplify that. We've got true on the left hand side. OK. And we could then finish off with reflexivity as well. OK. So I'll leave it to you to finish off the rest of those. Uh, hopefully, you see this proof pattern here, and you can use simple to get that intermediate step, or you can just directly jump to reflexivity to prove the whole thing. 
and I needed to do delete my admitted here. That's what's going wrong in order for me to compile past that and through the rest of those as well. Okay, so most of these exercises are going to be omitted from this kind of terse version of the notes. Uh, I just wanted to show you how they work and how to solve them yourself if you are following along.